Okay, so I have a quick presentation talking about linear models in case um, people aren't as familiar about this. So we are looking at these two layer or these two columns in our data. I'm just gonna move into, what oh, doesn't happen, okay. We have two columns of continuous data, meaning that we have a bunch of numbers of very wide range, average glucose and BMI. In general, relationships are very hard to see if we're just visually looking over this data. We perhaps could say that 70 is the lowest number on our average glucose, is 148 the lowest? No, there's 102. It's very mundane, not very effective. What we wanna do is visualize the data and then try and draw a line to see if there's a correlation between these two. So we're gonna take our data, run a linear model, and then visualize it. When I say we're working with linear models, we are trying to see if there's a relationship between two variables. Uh, this can be a confusing topic because variables have a lot of names that mean the same thing. So we might have a predictor variable and a response variable. So for example, biomarkers in cancer are very um, hot topic. If we can find a level, say if your level of insulin in your blood increases, that indicates that you have cancer, it's a lot easier to measure your blood level compared to directly finding the cancer and measuring its size. So we have an in, uh, indirect measurement. So in that situation, we would use our blood level of a certain protein as a predictor for the response, which is perhaps tumor size. A lot more invasive to be measuring tumor size, a lot easier to be measuring our predictor variable. So our predictor variable generally is our X variable, also can be referred to as the input and independent variable. Whereas our response variables on the Y axis and can also be called the output and dependent. In our linear models, um, we have observations. So for the data that we're working with, we have an observation. So person number one had this measurement for glucose, this measurement for BMI. Observation number two, we have this level and this level. So we have a bunch of observations. Everything is wrapped up in noise for like technical noise and perhaps um, just like biological noise. And what we wanna be able to see is something that looks like this. When we plot our X variable and our Y variable, they scatter in a trend and we can draw a regression line that models a relationship. So that even though we don't have a dot that's exactly at this point, now that I can quantify the trend between it, I can start predicting and say that, well, if then I find somebody that has a plasma level of X, can I then give them a prediction of how likely they'd have a large tumor? So when we're modeling between our dependent and our independent variable, we're not likely to have a one-to-one -one relationship. We need some modifiers. So we have our slope coefficient. If we have a positive slope, that means as X increases, Y increases. If we have our negative slope, as X increases, Y decreases. And if we have no slope, this is what we saw with our data source dozen. It's noise. You have dots everywhere. There's no good line that you can draw to show a correlation between your X and your Y variable. The other thing that you can modify is a Y intercept. So Y intercept one is higher than Y intercept two. This is going back to our high school formulas of Y equals MX plus B. Um, we also have like a or different ways of calling this. Um, but the fundamentals we want to walk away with is we can modify the slope and we can modify the y intercept. Keep in mind, we do have an element of error, but most cases we try to pretend that this doesn't exist because it's hard to model something so stochastic. But as biologists working with real data, we have to keep in mind that there is going to be noise that we can't recognize in the model itself. So when we create our linear model, it's going to give us a whole lot of numbers. Don't panic. We'll go through each of these steps together. So the first part of the output is it's going to give you the formula. How is it looking for a relationship between these two things? We have our data equals heart. So we have the heart data set that we've been working with. 
And we have a bit of a function over here because we have our two column names, average glucose level, BMI. So I want to see the way that we might read this is we're interpreting average glucose level as a function of BMI. So we may be able to um, record our BMI easier than we are able to determine our own glucose level, right? Because we can step on a pound, we can go and measure our height, but at home, it's difficult for us if you don't have the right technology to measure our glucose level. Next up is residuals. So when we're drawing a line of the best fit, we know that not all data points are going to land exactly on the line. We want to get as close as possible, but the residual is the difference between the observed and the expected. So here, our expected values are the line that we drew, and the observed value is our little data point. So here we have a positive residual, and if we have a data point that we throw over there, this is a much bigger residual. When we're fitting our line of best fit onto our data, we're trying to minimize the residual of all our data points so that we can have a line that best models what we have. So this residual is a summary of how good our line is, how far away is our observed versus our expected. We generally are not going to touch this too much. It's just returning some facts to you. If you see it very big, that's an indication that it's not a very good line. Um, but that's what residuals mean. Um, because we have some residuals that are positive and negative, if you just add them together, it's going to negate each other. So you could have a situation in which your residual is zero and it looks like it's very good. So what we do is we square them so that everything gets turned positive. And another result of that is that the data points that are furthest away, once you square them, it becomes an even bigger influence to say that we have an even worse module, uh, model. What we care most about is our coefficients. So when we're talking about y equals mx plus b, the coefficients are this m and this b. So we have our intercept value that's returned to us. It's estimating that the intercept is 88. So we would put that over here. And the coefficient of BMI, we will put that over here. We're working with a simple linear model, meaning that there is one predictor and one output. But you can imagine that most diseases aren't this simple, they're complex. So you might wanna be looking at height, you might wanna be um, looking at like the uh, number of meals or perhaps like fat in your diet. You can build a more complex model, takes in multiple variables for a single prediction as the output, but that gets pretty complex about how you balance each of those. So we're just gonna look at a very basic, simple model, one predictor, one output. But this sets it up so that we could have multiple things that we're looking at. So we would slot in the intercept as 88 and our slope as 0 0.1. Notice that our slope is very small right now, right? It's close to zero. However, we do still, um, so it's close to zero, but it's positive. So we can show that for every increase in BMI, there is an increase in glucose level because it's positive. Um, however small this effect is, notice that we have these triple stars over here because we have our p-value. Our p-value is to the power of negative 16, and the triple stars means that its significance is close to zero. So keep in mind then this means that the results we see are statistically significant, but whether this is meaningful for the biology that you're looking at is up for you to decide, right? So if eating five kilograms of carrots increases your test mark by 2%, is it still meaningful for you to be eating five kilograms of carrots every day? There is a link, there's a statistical link, but whether it's like biologically relevant to you is another call. So remember, we are, we are working with numbers at the end of the day. And at the bottom, we have our multiple R squared. So this is looking at the percentage of variance in Y explained by X. So here with 0 0.02, that means that 2% of the variation um, in our average glucose is explained by BMI. So not a lot. We don't need to be using the adjusted R squared until you get into complex linear models. 
where you need to be correcting for multiple inputs for a single output. So this is a summary slide. I like the rule of three. So when we're walking away from interpreting a linear model, three key things we want to take note of. The direction of the effect, whether this is a positive as x increases, y increases, a negative as x increases, y decreases, or nothing. So the direction of the effect, for us, we have a positive. We have the size of the effect. So although we have statistical significance, is 3% very meaningful for us? Is this going to change the way that we practice? Or is this enough to introduce a new intervention? So these are the three things that I would summarize as important when we get our output of a linear model. So I think that is the end of this linear model. I know I went through a lot. Do we have any questions about this? Looking at continuous variables. Maybe there's some, some sort of relationship between the effects that we want to. Whatever changes, and it doesn't show up changes in the dependent about the effect. Once it cut to certain level, then you can start swing on something. You mean like there is no correlation between exactly. average glucose level for people shorter than six feet, or but people six, taller than six feet have the effect? What melts or doesn't melt? I'm sorry? Like melting of the ice. So if you even mm -hmm. increase the temperature from minus 20, minus 50, 10, it doesn't melt. Mm -hmm. But then that's not a that's not a linear thing, right? Not, so, so you wouldn't use a linear model. It would it would have to be a different model. So complex models will be fitting for things that aren't a straight line. But when you're working with a simple linear model, it always is going to be this y equals mx plus b. It's always going to be a straight line. If you have data that is not linear, that is okay, but you cannot use a linear model. That can be applied to the blood pressure. Like the blood pressure can be scanned for the cell up to certain blood pressure, the pain, those can Yep. But then it costs that. It depends on the shape of the data. So if you can transform a pair, um, if you can transform a skewed data set into a normalized line, then you can use it. So if you apply a transformation and it moves back into a normal distribution, then that's okay. But if you, but there are other things, there are other statistical models that you can apply. So all of these tests, again, this isn't a stats course, so I'm not going too much into the assumptions for either, each of these tests, but it sounds like you have a situation in which the assumptions of a linear model are not met. Therefore, you cannot use a linear model. I was thinking if we just put a cut up from there, we would apply the intervention. Sure. But then you're, yeah, you would, no matter what you do, you can transform the data, you can select the data. But then, yeah, it depends on your use case. I don't know if that would be the best way of handling it, but that would be a way of handling it. <laughs>